You know, today I'm going to begin by just sharing, you know, every family has, most every family has like a food story. They, they have food that's special to them, meaningful to them. Uh, sometimes it even carries tradition with it. You know, when I was growing up, my mom made the best French toast. Now, I know when I say that, some of you are thinking, you know, it's eggs and milk. You know, what's the big deal? Well, I didn't know that because that's not how my mom made it. And so when I would go to a friend's house and spend the night, and uh, perhaps their mom was making breakfast in the morning, and they're like, do you like French toast? And I'm like, uh, yes, oh yeah, because with four boys in our home, we love French toast for breakfast. It was this hearty meal, and, and she would make the French toast, and it would come out, and it's all like floppy and flimsy, and there's hardly any, anything on it. And I'm like, what's this? They're like, it's French toast. And I'm like, oh, that's not French toast. And I didn't know what it was. They made it with like milk and eggs. But my mom, that's not how she made it. My mom made French toast the way my father's mom, I mean, my dad's mom made French toast. And probably her mom before that made French toast. And it was, it, it was eggs and milk, yes, but also flour. And then anything else you want to put in there, you can put a little almond in there, a little flavoring, whatever you want to add. It was like a batter, like this rich batter. And you dip your bread into the batter. And then you put it into like pretty good oil in the, in the frying pan, and, and you fry these things, like you got to have enough oil. If it's just a little bit, it doesn't work. You have enough oil, it probably gets at least halfway up on the bread, and you fry these things, and it comes out, and when you put that dollop of butter on there, and then you put some powdered sugar and syrup on there, delicious. It is amazing. I actually Googled this week, uh, you know, French toast, and I was like looking for a picture to show you on the screen. I'm like, no, that's not it. That's not it. You know, scroll, scroll, scroll. After some time, I'm like, I'm not going to waste time looking for my mom's French toast because apparently it, very few people have it out there on the internet to look at. And I just began to realize, you know, m mom's French toast was unique and it was brilliant. And, and apparently we are very rare uh, when it comes to this. And so we're very special. And so French toast, that was, it sustained the Bushnell family and the four boys through many a breakfast through our years. That was the Bushnell story. And then you had the Conovers, my wife's family. They had their food story. Theirs was fiesta. If you don't know what fiesta is, think taco salad, but it's not taco salad. Like, first of all, starting with the meat. It's not taco meat. You, you take the, the hamburger meat and you chop it all up with onion and salt, and then you add to it brown sugar and then tomato sauce, and that becomes your meat. And then you pile it up. You put it on rice with some crumbled up chips, and, and you put you know, sour cream and, and salsa and cheese and tomatoes, and you just build it up with any and everything you want. We, we would do green olives and, and walnuts. You could even add uh, coconut. Some people like coconut on there. I don't. I don't do the coconut thing. Lettuce, and you just build this thing up and mounds up. And that's what we use for birthdays. That's what we use for family gatherings. Like in, in, in our home, now in the Bushnell family, fiesta has been used for a lot of our meals, and we love it. It makes great leftovers. You can eat on it for days, and it continues to get better with time. I mean, this is just like a great meal. We love Fiesta. It has sustained the Conover, now Bushnell family, through many years. So Bushnell's had a family story or food story. Conover's had one. Our church has a food story. Uh, last week, the McShane family, they smoked 800 pounds of pork for our church picnic. If you were there, you know. You know that this has been our food story for years. And then we freeze it, whatever's left over, we always pray there's some left over, and there always is, and we freeze it, and then we use it for funeral meals, we, we'll, we'll use it for college troughs sometimes, we'll use it for leadership team meals. Uh, there's even been times when, when uh, Lisa Buckler's broken it out, and we've had like barbecue nachos with the pork on there. Mm, it is so good. So our, our church family has just been sustained through the years with this smoked pork, and it's incredible. I, I'm telling you, we, we have these food stories that are meaningful. The Israelites had a food story that was very significant to them, very meaningful to them. Jesus alludes to it, and they allude to it in John chapter 6. If you have a Bible or, or the, that you can open or a device, open up to John chapter 6 to look at their food story that was deeply ingrained into their culture. It had great significance and meaning to them. And it is one of those stories that reflected their relationship with the Almighty God. And it was one that had to do with how God had sustained them through the wilderness when they were in the desert, you know, million plus people there being sustained by God in the wilderness. And so in John chapter 6, at the apex of Jesus' ministry, when he's just 
preach to a crowd of 5,000 people. And they came because they had seen his miraculous healings and his popularity was building up and they were amazed. And so 5,000 men plus women plus children come to the mountainside to listen to Jesus and there he feeds them with five loaves of bread and two salt-dried fish. He feeds 5,000 men plus women plus children. There's 12 basketfuls left over. The people are amazed and they're excited, so much so that they're gonna make him king, king of the Jews by force if they have to because they wanna see Rome defeated. What they wanted more than anything else was political salvation. They wanted political freedom from those Romans that were oppressing them and they desired it so much so. And Jesus is aware that they're going to try to force him to be king, and so he withdraws. The disciples get in a boat. They go across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, this is the time he walks on water to them. Another miracle. He gets in the boat with them, and it says immediately it reached the other side. Apparently no more rowing needed. They'd already gone like three or four miles out. Boom, they're there. But Jesus is doing this because he has a different priority. He has a different agenda. And the text tells us that that they were in search of Jesus, which sounds good. I mean, they're they're trying to look for him. It sounds good. But the problem is they don't don't really want Jesus, not what he's going to offer them. What they really want is more Panera. They love Panera bread. And that's what he offers them. That's what they desire. But Jesus has something more in mind. Here's what Jesus says. This is in John 6, beginning in verse 26. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. See, that was their food story. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They say, give us a sign. Some of the rabbis had taught that when the Messiah comes, you would know him because he would call down manna from heaven and it would come. And so if Jesus was the Messiah, he could call down manna from heaven. So some thought of it in that way. The Israelite food story is the story of manna. It's found in Exodus 16, where after God delivered the Israelites out of slavery, out of Egypt, they go into the desert, into the wilderness, and there we learn that God sustained them with food. He gave them meat in the form of quail, And then he gave them carbs in the form of manna. He also sustained them with water from a rock. And the manna, when we hear about this, it actually means, what is it? Because it was different. It was unique from anything else. It was special, like my mom's French toast. In fact, it probably was my mom's French toast that got passed down from generations until it came to the Bushnells, but, but no, it wasn't. It wasn't that, because the Bible does describe it to us, even though it's hard to picture. It was a fine flake-like thing on the face of the ground, like coriander seed, not very big. It was white and gummy. That's how the Bible describes it. And they could collect it, and they could either boil it like porridge, or you could bake it and make it into a wafer or a cake. And it said it tasted like it had honey in it. That's how manna is described. I picture it that if it was a cereal, it would be called honey bunches of manna. That's what it would be called. And you could even add some milk to it and eat it that way. But this is what it was. It it was this, this bread from heaven. For 40 years, the Israelites received that every single morning. God fed them for 40 years with manna from heaven, and they would collect it, but they could only collect the amount they needed for that day. 
If they collected more, it would rot and get maggots in it. It was a way in which God was saying, each and every single day, you look to me to provide your needs. I'm your sustainer. I'm the one that gives you what you need for life. You can trust me. You didn't trust me to go to the promised land? So every single day, you're going to have to trust that I'm going to give you what you need. That's what the story of manna taught, is that one day at a time. It's the same thing that Jesus prayed in his prayer, give us today our daily bread. It's that same principle that we trust God for today and we believe him and we trust in him. And on the sixth day of the week, they would collect a double portion because the Sabbath rest on Saturday, they couldn't collect any. And on that one, it wouldn't rot. God gave them, let them collect what they needed for two days instead of just one. And he did this for 40 years, sustaining them. This was their food story, this miraculous provision of God. I mean, what an awesome food story. What an awesome tradition, something of great significance and meaning in their relationship with the Almighty God. It was, it was important. That was their story. And when you look at that, how Jesus sustains us, doesn't want us to worry about tomorrow. Jesus tells them Moses was not the one who gave you bread from heaven. It was God. He did. And they asked for a sign. Jesus, what will your sign be? Which is just demonstrating their unwillingness to put their belief in him because he's already given them signs. The whole reason they come to the mountainside is because they've seen his miraculous healings of the sick and of the demon-possessed. And then at the mountainside, they see him feed 5,000 people. And then they, some of them went across the lake on boats. Jesus walked on water. We already have all the evidence we need to put our faith and our trust in Jesus. We've been given everything we need. The question is, will you trust him today? Will you put your belief in him today? Will you follow him today with what he's already given you? That's the question. And Jesus says to the people, you've seen me, yet you do not believe. You want some other sign or an additional sign. And I've already given you one. I've even fed you with bread myself. Some of these people will see Jesus risen from the dead, and they still will not believe. The issue is not that he's not shown up. It's that they're not believing and trusting him for each day. And so here's what Jesus says to them. Look at this. It's in John 6, 32. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. We always want this bread. Of course, they're thinking Panera, not what Jesus is going to give them. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. And they got disappointed. I am the bread of life. If only they knew, if only they knew that every desire they had would be fulfilled in Jesus, that it could be. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you've seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all of those he's given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say the son, uh, how can he, is this, uh, where am I at? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I'm the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. Jesus comes back to their food story. Yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus is going to say, yeah, manna food story was amazing. I'm going to give you a better one. I'm greater than manna. 
In fact, I'm the one who sustained you with manna. We'll get to more of that later. And Jesus is going to, he's going to institute a new food story for the church. One that carries even greater significance than that. And when we read about Jesus talking about quenching our thirst and giving us food and being who we want, you know, there's certain things that are essential for life. Things like food, water, air. I mean, we need this. But we have most of those things in our society, and yet we often still feel empty. And the reason that we feel so empty is because we're missing some things. We too, like those Israelites, are focused on the temporal and the temporary and not that which is eternal. And Jesus is drawing them into something far more significant. C.S. Lewis, on the true source of happiness, he says, God made us, invented us as a man invents a machine. A car is made to run on petrol. Now, we know some now are made to run on battery, but most still on petrol. And it would not run properly on anything else. Now, God designed the human race to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. He's revealing to us that that Jesus is the bread of life. And he is the greater food source that we all need. And in him, he gives life to the world. He himself does this. That's why in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, hey, Jesus, he's the one that was the water from the rock. He's the one that is the manna that feeds you. Like like Jesus would pour out his blood just like he poured out water to sustain them. His blood will forgive us. Like he's the life that we need. He's everything. But the people, they're satisfied with, with the bread. They're satisfied with the crumbs. They prefer the 12 basketfuls of leftovers than they do the Son of God. And Jesus says, do not work for food that spoils. Like all your labor is going into this bread. Like you walked 10 miles to come see me on that mountainside. And then you camped there. And then you spent the night. And then the next morning you made a search for me. And then you've, you've commandeered boats and you've come across the sea for me. Some of you from Tiberias landed, find out I'm not there. And you too have come. Like two full days of work. You have abandoned just so that you can be pursuing what? Me? No. Bread? Yes. They just wanted their satisfaction met for that day of more bread. Jesus is offering them eternal life, but they want the crumbs. Brian Jennings, uh, a minister at at a church in Tulsa, he was talking about this, and he said, it's like when you go to Roadhouse back in the day when you used to eat the peanuts and you could throw the shells on the floor. And so when when you walked in, you were like crunch, crunch, all the shells as you walked around and I don't think they do that anymore, but I guess you could. But they, uh, the shelves are on the floor. It'd be like the waitress coming to your table, and, and you've got this menu in front of you with all the steak options and the baked potatoes and the sweet potatoes and all the, the rolls and everything else. So you have it that you could order right then and there. And she's like, what do you want? And you're like, I, I, can I just have the shelves off the floor? She's like, you're crazy. You're crazy. Who would eat the shelves off the floor? Yeah, that's, that's what it's like. When we live for the temporal here and now, when Jesus wants to give you something eternal, we settle for crumbs instead of the fulfilling bread of life that that Jesus wants to offer. It's like the the difference between sometimes the the little crackers and nibbles that you might eat and some of Lisa Buckler's bread, if you've ever ever had it. It's, It's night and day. But we settle, and here's how we settle. We settle for the crumbs of immediate satisfaction and for the crumbs of temporary comfort. Like we just want these immediate needs satisfied right now, right here. We settle for bread that nourishes the body and yet we neglect that bread of life that nourishes our soul. We want Jesus to improve our life right here, right now, but we we devalue the eternal life he's come to bring that starts right now. We focus more on the outer life rather than the inner life. We want the outside looking presentable rather than preparing our soul spiritually with the food that Jesus gives. We work for manna. We put in time, effort, money for manna, things that do not last, instead of consuming Jesus who gives us life for all eternity. 
Manna was a gift just to the Jews for a period of time that lasted there for about 40 years. And Jesus is saying, I'm the gift for the whole world that all who believe in me may experience life eternal. Jesus' vision is that he would be your sustainer and he would be the fulfillment of your every desire. Your desires that you have in the deepest part of yourself are met in the person of Jesus. And that's what he's revealing. Eat me, consume me, drink me, and you will be fulfilled. I heard John Mark Comer say your strongest desires may not be your deepest desires. So what you think you want may not be the thing you really need or want. And because we live in a world that is preying on your desires, manipulating your desires, manufacturing those desires, coercing those desires, you may end up thinking that these desires that, are, that you currently feel have to be met or you'll be miserable. But could it be in the meeting of all of our current desires, it explains why we are miserable in spite of the fact that most of them are being met and it's because there's actually deeper desires that we are neglecting deeper desires that we are not giving attention to. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life that's come into the world, and the people are like, always give us this bread. Their, their strong desire was for bread, but it was for physical needs, not for the bread of heaven. And Jesus doesn't give them the physical bread again, like he did the day before, because he doesn't want them getting addicted to temporary solutions that do not actually satisfy in the long run. You see, trying to meet an eternal need with temporary good, it won't satisfy. Not only do we make idols out of dumb things, we even make idols out of good things. It's, it's, it's okay to desire bread, like bread's a good thing. But we often value the temporary over the eternal. We pursue immediate physical need instead of who Jesus is. And that greatest temptation to having legitimate needs met in illegitimate ways is to enjoy God's legitimate gifts in illegitimate ways. And so his gifts, he wants to give of food and drink and comfort and intimacy and community and friendship. We often seek it in illegitimate ways. And it leaves us feeling empty, always thinking we gotta have more. Don't settle for immediate satisfaction and temporary comfort. Jesus is saying to us right here, look, you were born not to eradicate your desires, but to reroute them and have them fulfilled in Jesus. So don't settle for anything less. That God who came to take you out of bondage, to free you, who provided for you in the wilderness, Jesus is saying, I am that God. I came down from heaven. Moses didn't feed you, my Father in heaven fed you, and I'm the bread of life. I'm the one that sustained you in the desert, and I'm the one, if you come to me now, you can trust me, you can believe in me, you can feast on me, and you will have life, and you will have it forever. So don't settle for the immediate and the temporary. Let me tell you a second thing we shouldn't settle for. Brian Jennings mentions this when he was talking about this text. He said, we also, he said, we settle for the crumbs of physical healing. The crumbs of physical healing. And he alludes to the chapter before this. In chapter 5, Jesus healed the lame man, the invalid of 38 years. It's one of the reasons the people came to see Jesus on the mountainside. And Jesus tells that man, stop sinning. If you don't stop sinning, something worse may happen to you. What Jesus is saying is that physical healing is not the same as spiritual healing. And what you need more than physical healing is spiritual healing. And I have healed you physically, but the reason I'm healing you physically is so that you can receive spiritual healing, so you know who I am and what I can do in your life so that others might believe in me. What you need is a change of heart. I can do that. What you need is spiritual healing. I can do that. What this man needs is the bread of life. Jesus is that. And he will die for that man's sins. And if that man just wants help with the leg thing, he just wants physical healing, and that's what he's after, that too is short-sighted and temporary. We sometimes will go for the crumbs of physical healing. Now we should pray for people to be healed physically. That, that is an appropriate thing to, to pray for. God is gonna heal you physically, whether it's immediately or eventually or ultimately. You're gonna be healed. It's gonna come. 
But here's the question. When you pray for someone's physical healing, are you also praying for their spiritual healing? If not, we value Panera over Jesus. The heart of Jesus was always that the physical healing would lead to spiritual healing. So that's what happened in the chapter before chapter 5 in John chapter 4 with the healing of an official son. After Jesus performed that healing, it tells us towards the end of that text in John 4, 53, that the whole household believed. And that's what Jesus wanted. The physical healing was so that they would believe in him and trust in him and know that he, in fact, is God who came to earth and he could perform those healings and he would do greater miracles than that to prove it. But he wanted them to believe. And that's what the bread of life is bringing. He's bringing spiritual healing. He's bringing the promise of eternal life. He's bringing a new heaven and a new earth. But we risk giving all of that away by loving earth's comforts. We risk giving it all away by loving earth's provisions rather than an eternal perspective. We settle. We settle for physical healing. We settle for temporary comfort. Here's something else we settle for. Number three, we settle for the crumb of political freedom. That's what was happening with, with the Jews. They wanted Rome defeated so much, so, to such a degree that when they saw Jesus perform the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, they intended to make him king by force. Why? Because they wanted more than anything else for Rome to fall. They didn't really want Jesus' kingdom. They wanted an earthly political kingdom that was stronger than the one that was domineering them. And you know, we can kind of take the same approach, honestly. We can be there too. Like their political freedom became their God. It wasn't Jesus. They wanted that more than Jesus. And Jesus wasn't building a political kingdom or an economic kingdom or a military kingdom. And so, yes, we, we want to live in a country that honors God, and we want those freedoms that, that God gives. We, we desire all of that. But where we probably need to be careful, if, if, if we say the reason we need God is to fix our country, well, yeah, it would require God to fix anything. But that makes God the means to the end instead of the end itself. We need God for God. Like, we just need God, period. And we need God in our life. And what we want is to see his kingdom reign and rule. That's highest priority, even over whatever is happening politically. But they weren't there yet. They didn't see it that way. And so seven times in this chapter, Jesus is going to say that he came down from heaven. Like he is the almighty God. He is God in the flesh. I mean, what a massive claim. He carries, because of that, the authority and the attributes of the Father. If you are the Son of God, then you get the inheritance of everything that belongs to your Father that puts you equal with God. The Jews knew that. This was an audacious claim of Jesus. I have come from heaven. I am of God. In fact, I am God. That's what he's saying. He comes with the full authority that makes it clear that he and the Father are one. And so Jesus says this. In John 6, 35, whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He says in verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Jesus is real food. He's bread from heaven. Only he can raise you up at the last day. You must consume him. You must feed on him. He must be the one you seek after, the one you hunger and thirst after. He must be the one that every day you say, not my will, but yours be done. He must be the one that you pursue, that you seek. You must feast on Jesus, not something else, not some substitute. And at this, it tells us in verse 41, the Jews began to grumble. They're grumbling like, wait, wait a minute. You're, you're like, we knew Joseph. We knew Mary. Like, who do you think you are? And it's interesting because in the Old Testament, when they got manna, they were grumbling at that time as well, and God told them to stop grumbling. Grumbling is listed in, in the sins. like of, 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 It's listed among the worst sins that are listed in Scripture, grumbling, because you're complaining about God, and you're, you're not filled with any gratitude to the Lord, and, and they're just grumbling. Like Grumbling is not a spiritual gift, even though some of you may think that it is. It is not a spiritual gift. Social media is not helping you with your grumbling at all. It's not. We, too, can tend to grumble just like they did. And in verse 63, even though Jesus says, I have the words of spirit and of life, it tells us that some did not believe. In fact, verse 66 tells us from that time on, many of them no longer followed him. They settled. They settled for crumbs instead of the fulfilling life that Jesus wanted to give them. They were settling, and we do it too. We too settle 
for these poor substitutes, for what, only what Jesus can give. And throughout Israel's history, they did it over and over again. They kept looking for these substitutes to fill them up. And it took away the real thing. They looked for something else to fill them. And when you do that, it puts not only your body at risk, but your soul at risk. It's not healthy to take a cheap substitute. So I was trying to think about that this week. Do I have an example of this? And actually the story that came to mind is a, I guess you could call it a food story. Or you could call it a, a medicine story. But years ago, my youngest brothers, there's four of us, and my youngest brother, Rick, we I always called him Ricky, but he had just started dating this girl. Her name was Brianna. And they had just started dating. It was pretty early on. But he was bringing her to Springfield, which was a pretty big deal because we were having a birthday celebration at our house. And they lived in Joplin. My brother lived in Joplin. My parents lived in Joplin. So uh, they were coming up to Springfield to celebrate this birthday. I don't remember whose it was, but they were coming to the house. But what we know is that, that Ricky, he was living with one of my parents and at that time, and he had this dog named Rusty. Rusty was a corgi. Rusty was a stray. Ricky took the dog in and was caring for this dog, and Rusty became part of the family. And Rusty had had surgery for something. I don't remember now what it was. But uh, as a result, um, Ricky was you know, taking care of him and giving him the medicine that Rusty had to have. So Ricky had that set out on the counter for, or Ricky had that set out for Rusty to give him. And they were in a hurry, and they were talking, and Brianna said to Ricky, do you have any Tylenol? She was like, I'm really fighting a headache right now. He's like, yeah. So he got in the medicine county, pulled out the Tylenol, and he set it down. He was getting some water for her. They were talking. He handed her the medicine and, and the water, and she took it. And then he went down to give Rusty his medicine and realized he had given Brianna the, Bri, the wrong medicine. And so she just took the dog medicine, and there was the Tylenol sitting on the counter because he was like, oh, wait, don't take it, don't take it. And she already had. She had swallowed it, and he just given her the dog pill. You can imagine how horrifying this is with your new girlfriend going to take her to Springfield with this family event, and she just took your dog's pill, and they didn't know, like, is this, what's in it? Like, what's in that pill? Like, they're calling call the poison control, and of course, they don't know what's in the pill, and so I mean, they're, they're cause, calling people, trying to figure this out. I think they were trying to reach out to the vet to call the emergency line to find out, like, what's in the medicine? Like, what's in this thing? So anyway, I mean, he thought, you know, did, did, I, did I just kill my girlfriend? I mean, there's that thought was going on in his head. So anyway, they went through this whole process and eventually just uh, came to Springfield anyway. And the good news is, he, Bree did not die. He didn't kill her. That's the good news. She survived. Uh, it was just weird because she rolled down the window, stuck her head out the whole way down to <laughs> I-44. So that part was weird. Just a little wind blown in the hair, but she survived. And so, you know, that's kind of our fun story about Ricky, you know, tried to kill his girlfriend before, you know, really spending time with family. But it, it was a poor substitute, you know, for the real thing. I, I don't think it helped the headache. I think her headache probably didn't go away because it, it didn't do what it was intended to do. And while we often can even find ways in which we've done that in stupid ways, and it's, it can even be funny, when, when Jesus is talking in this moment, it's, it's a very serious, it's a very serious occasion because they are living off poor substitutes, immediate satisfaction, temporary comfort. They, they want physical healing right now. That's what's most important to them. They want the temporal, not the eternal. And Jesus is letting them know that this is a life and death situation. And I am the bread of life, and he who believes in me will not thirst again. If you come to me, you will not be hungry. I am the fulfillment of your every desire. I am the ultimate fulfillment of everything that you need. You come to me. And what he's revealing to them is, I really am what you wanted all along. But sadly, from that time on, thousands walked away from Jesus. They couldn't see with an eternal perspective. They were too focused on the crumbs to see the eternal life that Jesus was wanting to bring. And Jesus is saying, I'm providing the sustenance for your soul. I'm providing you with what you need for daily life. And what Jesus is revealing in this moment is that there's a greater food story than the manna. It's me. 
Jesus is revealing there's a greater food story than the feeding of the 5,000. It's going to be me. I'm the bread of life. And it's in this moment that Jesus tells them, unless they eat his flesh and drink his blood, they won't have this life. They won't have this fulfillment. They won't have eternal life. And it's a food story where he he begins to reveal to us, he's starting to lay it out right here in John 6. Before we ever get to the Last Supper, Jesus is already indicating for us that he's going to go to the cross and his body is going to be broken for us and his blood is going to be poured out for us. Paul would allude to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 whenever he says Jesus is the water from the rock. How is that? Because he's talking about how his blood was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is our sustenance. He's our life, the eternal life that we need. And Jesus is beginning to lay the foundation of a new food story for the church. And it won't be the 800 pounds of pulled pork. It won't be that. It's way better. In this food story, Jesus will give us his body and his blood to eat and to drink. And yes, there's some figurative language here as Jesus talks that is catching these people off guard. Like he says in John 6, 50, 54, But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood is eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. There is no doubt that Jesus is pointing to his crucifixion. He's talking about that he would die, and he would be the sacrifice for the sins of the world. And I know if we take that just completely literally, then we're cannibals, right? Eating flesh and blood, and yet it's figuratively literal. (laughs) Like he really did pay the price for us. And he really is our sustaining food and drink. And we put our faith and trust in him and what he did through the sacrifice of his body and the pouring out of his blood. And when we eat of communion, which which Jesus describes for us when he was with the disciples in that upper room, and he tears the bread, breaks it, and says, this is my body. It was in the breaking of the bread. It signifies his body broken for us. And then he pours the cup of of that fruit of the vine, the wine, and he says, when you drink of this, this is my blood poured out for you. And it's in the eating of that bread that we reflect on the body of Jesus broken for us. It's in the the drinking of that cup. Remember, his blood poured out for us for our redemption, the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, 7 says. He is the food we need. And we now have a new food story in the church. In fact, every week, we spend some time to reflect on it. It carries deep meaning for us. It's deeply ingrained in us. It's the food story that sustains us. In fact, we're going to do this together right now. And if you did not, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and you've surrendered your life to him, and you did not pick up one of these communion cups. I want to invite you to do that right now at our tables at the back of the room. There are some of these communion cups. Now would be a great time to receive that and bring it with you to your seat because we're going to partake, we're going to receive communion together. Eating of bread represents his body, broken for us. So here in a moment, we're going to take this bread that already represents a body broken. This particular bread, I find it best if you just let it dissolve on your tongue. And then we're going to take of this juice representing the blood poured out for us, and we're going to remember the greatest food story of all, of all time, where our Savior, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to earth and paid the price for our sins on the cross. He became the substitute for us. He became the ransom for us. He paid the price for us so that we could be free of our guilt and we could be empowered to live a new life. And so today... I invite you not to walk away from Jesus like those in John 6, 66 did. It was a tragic day when they did. But instead, you do what others did. 
which is to believe in him and to trust him, to surrender all to him, to believe that he's the one that was sent to feast on him. This whole conversation about Jesus being the bread of life, it's all about his relationship with you and how he wants to be so close to you in your life that you consume him. You feast on him. And so Jesus, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you gave us the greatest gift of all in the person of Jesus. God in the flesh to come and die on the cross for our sins to pay it so that we could be free, eternally free, free from our guilt, free from our shame, free from sin's power. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this great gift and we remember you now so that we might repent, we might rededicate, we might remember, we might reflect, we might turn to you and feast on you for you are our very life. May our every desire be fulfilled in you as we find that fulfillment in you as we seek you, pursue you. And so church, as you open this up, let's receive this bread representing the body of Jesus that was broken for us. Let's receive this at this time. And then church, let's receive the juice, the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. As we drink this, let's remember him and his sacrifice. Let's take a few moments to bow our heads and to reflect on Jesus as the source of life, the source of bread, the source of everything we need. Following this time of reflection as we sing, if anyone would want to receive Jesus, believe in Jesus, if you'd like prayer, our prayer team is going to be here around the room, and I'll be right over here at Decision Point. We'd love to meet with you over here uh, to your right on the front of this room. But at this time, let's reflect on Jesus. Jesus.